let's take a moment now to pray. And as we pray, let's prepare our hearts to receive God's word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that we're able to be together this morning. Uh, as uh, Reese reminded us earlier in the service, there are Christians in other places who uh, simply do not enjoy this freedom. Uh, there are Christians in countries where if they were to go to a Christian worship service, they would be worried about being uh, surveilled. Um, they would be worried about being stopped and asked what they're doing. I thank you that we have none of that fear here in Australia. Uh, thank you for the provision of this hall. Uh, thank you uh, for all of the things that allow us to worship in the way that we believe we ought. I thank you that we can look forward to some fellowship together afterwards. But now we ask, that, Father, that you would be very kind and merciful to us in allowing us to understand the word of God. We ask that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes to understand. I pray that he would uh, impress the truths of Holy Scripture upon our hearts. And we would ask for grace to go from here this morning and to apply the things that you teach us. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would... Uh, really watch over and superintend and accompany this time of preaching. This we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. If you are at all familiar with cricket, uh, you will know that fast bowlers uh, run up to the crease. They use their run up to generate momentum that helps them release the ball at pace. And uh, some fast bowlers have quite long run-ups. Maybe some West Indian fast bowlers come to mind. Uh, they have run-ups that are substantially longer than the length of the cricket pitch. Well, I say that because this morning I'm going to, as it were, come in off a long run-up to get to the passage of scripture that we're going to focus on. But I think the lengthy introduction will make sense. I'm going to begin this morning with two questions. I'm going to ask them and then take a few minutes to expand on each one and then we'll go to the text of scripture we're going to concentrate on. But here are the two questions. Number one, do you believe the Bible is true? Number two, what kind of person do you want to be? Number one, do you believe the Bible is true? Number two, what kind of person do you want to be? Regarding the first question, uh, the fact that you're here at a Christian service of worship and at a church that has the word Bible in its name probably indicates that your answer is yes. You believe the Bible is true. You believe it is true in what it says about God, about the origins of the universe, about human history and about the human condition. You believe the Bible tells us the truth about who Jesus is and about the way to God and everlasting life. I suspect most, if not all of you, would readily affirm what is written in our church's statement of faith. Concerning the Bible, it says, the 66 books of the Bible form the complete written revelation of God to man. They are the final authority in all matters of faith and practice and are sufficient for every aspect of life. This goes further than saying that the Bible is true. We confess that the Bible is from God, the one true and living God. It is his revelation to us, and because it is from God, it has authority and it is sufficient. That is, there is nothing that we need to know in order to live under the authority of God that the Bible doesn't tell us. Now again, I think I'm right in assuming that just about everyone in this room would affirm this about the Bible, that it is true, that it is the word of the living God, and as such it has authority over our lives, and it is sufficient for our lives. To put this another way, most of us, maybe all of us, don't see the Bible as merely being a collection of stories and sayings that are helpful in living a good and happy life. Uh, we don't see the Bible as being one spiritual text among many. If that's what I thought the Bible was, then I wouldn't be here this morning. Uh, I would be out having a lovely breakfast at Bangalore while reading a book on the politics of India or the Crusades or some other subject. 
and the same is probably true for you. Uh, you'd be at the beach or doing some gardening or tinkering in the shed if you thought the Bible was just one spiritual text among many. Now I want to park here for just a moment because this can become something of a throwaway line, you know, something of a Christian cliche. Of course I believe the Bible is true. Of course I believe the Bible is the Word of God. We can miss the significance of this statement. We can miss the weight and the gravity of this confession. We're talking about the Bible being the Word of God, as in the eternal, self-existent, all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere present, transcendent, triune creator of the heavens and the earth. That's who has spoken to us in this book. This is his word. The one who spoke every atom into existence. The one who ignited every star. The one who designed and brought into being all that fascinates us in the natural world. The one who formed our first parents and breathed into them the breath of life. The one who set Mount Sinai on fire when he came down. The one who demonstrated his immeasurable love for us by sending his only begotten son into the world to bleed and to die for us and for our salvation. This is his word. The word by which he reveals himself and his will to us. When we say that the Bible is the word of God, we're saying something profound. We're saying something monumental. If this is what we believe, then it means we should take this book very seriously. So that's the first question. Do you believe the Bible is true? Now to the second question. What kind of person do you want to be? Now, I've been very deliberate in the way I've worded this question. I'm not asking, what would you like to experience in your life? I'm not asking, what would you like to own? Or, what is your idea of success? I, I don't want you to misinterpret the question. It's this, what kind of person do you want to be? Now, perhaps some of you are thinking, oh, I'd like to be a happy person or a patient person, or a strong person. Maybe you'd like to be the kind of person that other people respect, or the kind of person that other people want to hang out with. Or perhaps for some of you the bar is a bit lower, you're thinking, I'd just like to be a person who can hold it together. <laughs> uh, I'd like to be a stable person, and not such a mess. There is a verse in a very well-known portion of scripture that describes the kind of person that we all want to be. Now, I want to go to that verse now and think about it just a little bit with you this morning. Please open your Bible to Psalm 1. Psalm 1. If Psalm 23 is the most well-known in the Psalter, and then perhaps Psalm 100, and after that maybe Psalm 22, Psalm 1 is certainly in the top 5 or 10. I would imagine most of the adults in this room have heard at least one sermon on this psalm and probably many more. Many of us have memorized it and some of us grew up singing it. And I'm always a bit nervous when it comes to preaching on familiar texts, but I trust that the Holy Spirit will make it live to us once again and impress its truth upon us with fresh power. The description that I want to draw your attention to is in verse 3. If you'd like to look there, the psalmist says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I came to this psalm in my personal devotions not so long ago and at the time I was feeling quite anxious and quite discouraged and I read this verse which I'd read many times before and it hit me, you know, like, a, like an arrow in the chest. Yes! Yes! This picture of a tree planted by the rivers of water is exactly it! This is what I want to be. You know, there are other pictures in the Bible 
There is the boat being tossed to and fro by the winds and the waves. There are the sheep wandering around in the wilderness without a shepherd. There is the prodigal son looking after the pigs so hungry he's eyeing off their food. None of us want our lives to resemble these pictures. No, we want this one, don't we? <laughs> a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season with leaves that don't wither. Now we should have no problem seeing this in our mind's eye. If you've ever walked along the river here in Lismore, you've seen something like what is represented here. Now I think the psalmist is describing more of an agricultural scene. Uh, this tree has been planted by a farmer or an orchardist beside a river or an irrigation canal. But that said, if you've walked along that path that takes you from the, the Ballina Street Bridge behind the swimming pool and then down to the double bridges, you've seen this. You've seen big, beautiful, leafy trees that have evidently grown large and strong because they've received sustenance from the river. They've been able to draw from that continual supply of water. So what does this picture communicate? Uh, what, what characteristics are represented by this image, by this lovely scene? Well, there's probably more than three, but that's as many as I'm going to mention, and perhaps these are the main ones. I'll give them to you up front and then talk about each one. This picture speaks of stability, fruitfulness, and consistency. Stability, fruitfulness, and consistency. Of course, there are rare occasions when trees get blown over. Uh, you see that around here from time to time, especially if there's been a lot of rain and then a big storm. But generally speaking, trees don't go anywhere. Uh, you don't wake up one morning and the tree outside your window is gone. <laughs> when the wind blows, a tree's branches bend, but the tree itself remains fixed in place. The tree in this scene is planted by a river, so we can imagine that it's healthy and strong. This is undoubtedly a picture of stability. This is a person who is not carried along or blown over by the circumstances of life. Rather, this is a person who is steadfast, who is secure, a person who has roots that go down deep. This is a person who is not thrown off course by the hard things in life or by unexpected crises. This is what we want for ourselves, don't we? To be stable inwardly, <laughs> to have control over our emotions and our desires rather than having them carry us along and drive our decisions. We want to be solid and steadfast in the face of difficult circumstances. We want to bend but not break. And we want stability in our relationships. We don't want our family life to be a soap opera. We don't want screaming matches and slam doors. We don't want our most important relationships to be characterised by emotional and psychological turbulence. And we want stability in terms of our direction and purpose in life. In other words, we want to be like this tree and not like the dandelion seeds that are blown all over the place by the wind. This is also a picture of fruitfulness. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. The longer I've been a Christian and the more I've studied the Bible, the more I've been drawn to this idea of fruitfulness. This metaphor is one that runs through the scriptures and there's a lot I could say about it, but let's consider this particular picture. This tree bears fruit as it's supposed to, when it's supposed to, in its season. In other words, this is a healthy tree fulfilling its purpose. And uh, let's think about the physiology of fruitfulness for a moment. There is a vital connection between the tree and its fruit. It's not like when we produce something, you know, when we knit a jumper, for example, or make a piece of furniture. When we do that, we take materials that are external to us and we combine them to produce that jumper or that table. Fruit is different. 
Fruit is produced via processes inside of the tree. It comes out of the tree. It is actually part of the organism or the entity that is the tree. You see the fruit there on the branches. That's why this is such a wonderful picture. True fruitfulness has to do with us, with our character, with our attitudes, with our behaviour. It's something going on inside of us that manifests itself outwardly, something that is part of us, part of what we are. Fruitfulness is not about material success or career success or being able to experience all the good things the world has to offer. Fruitfulness is about, is about being a person whose life is marked by much more valuable things like joy and peace and patience and love. Now I might be wrong but I think there are many people who are not Christians who are not interested in the Bible at all, but who know this is true. They might have the big house at Byron Bay, and the apartment at Bondi Beach, and the Range Rover, and the Mercedes, and thousands of followers on Instagram, Instagram and every other desirable thing, and yet they are throwing themselves into New Age spirituality, or into mindfulness, or into psychedelics, because what do they really want? What is their heart yearning for? True fruitfulness. They want to possess and experience peace and joy. They want to have self-control. They want to know real love. This is what we want, don't we? We want to be people whose lives are filled with these virtues, with the fruit of the Spirit. No, cash is great. I have no problem with cash. <laughs> but joy is better. An expensive holiday is wonderful, but a home filled with love is better. Way better. Becoming the CEO of the company is a great achievement, but having peace in the soul, oh, that's so much more precious. Now, this is not to say that these things are always mutually exclusive. They're not, but you get the point. Health, wealth and worldly success do not represent true fruitfulness. And we are not blind to this reality. We know what truly enriches our lives. We want to be like this tree in Psalm 1 and not like that scraggly old citrus in the backyard that hasn't produced lemons or oranges in years. Stability, fruitfulness... And then number three, this scene speaks of consistency or perhaps endurance is a better word. Notice that the leaves on this tree do not wither. Now, this is something we don't see very often here in the northern rivers of New South Wales. Uh, aside from the deciduous trees that have been planted and I'm thinking mainly of the pecans. We don't usually see trees losing their leaves. And that's because we're blessed with an abundance of water. In the 12 years I've lived here, I've only seen this once. A few years ago, when we went through a very long, dry spell, we did see some trees shed their leaves. Maybe you remember. I remember driving out to Danoon and seeing these mighty gum trees in pretty bad shape, very stressed by the lack of water. Some of them looked like they'd been burned. That doesn't happen to the tree in this picture. The leaves are green and vibrant in every season when the weather is pleasant and when the weather is oppressive. This tree consistently manifests life and health and growth and of course that's because it's been planted next to a river. I think we've all met people like this. Not people who are never sad or never upset or never angry or never discouraged, but people who consistently demonstrate that they have spiritual life. They're always in good spiritual health no matter what the circumstances might be. Now again, that doesn't mean they're never sad or discouraged, but it does mean that they continue to live as a Christian ought to live. They turn up. They fulfill their responsibilities, they minister to others, they're faithful to Jesus and faithful to others. We admire people like this, don't we? 
People who are going through really hard things, but their Christian life, their testimony, their love has not withered at all. The foliage on the tree is full and healthy in all seasons. And there is more that this picture communicates to us, but I think this is sufficient for our purposes today. This picture in Psalm 1 represents the person who is stable, fruitful and consistent, and I probably sound like a broken record, but this is the kind of person we all want to be. I've never met anyone who said, look, I'd really prefer to be unstable, unfruitful and inconsistent. I'd rather be all over the place emotionally. I'd rather have very troubled relationships. I'd rather lack direction in my life and be anxious and miserable all the time. <laughs> Nobody wants that. We all want this. We all want Psalm 1 verse 3. That brings us back to where we began this sermon, to that first question. Do you believe the Bible is true? Do you believe the Bible tells you the truth about God and about the human condition? Do you believe the Bible tells you the truth about Jesus and about salvation? Do you believe the Bible tells you the truth about life and about relationships? If your answer is a wholehearted yes and amen, then you will pay attention to verse 2 in this little psalm. Why is this person like a tree planted by a river? What's the secret? Look please at the text, verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Verse 3, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. How do we become people who are like this tree? How do we become the people we want to be? By regularly taking the Word of God into our lives. By meditating on it. By delighting in it. By having it soak into our minds and sink down into our souls. And that's what the Bible says and we believe the Bible is true, right? His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Well, I'm not sure the psalmist intended to communicate this, but the river of water in this scene is very much like the word of God. The tree is secure and healthy because it is continually drawing sustenance from that river. And in the same way, we draw our sustenance. Our strength, our wisdom, our consolation from the Bible. These are the words of life. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And those words are right here. The Holy Spirit works in us. He changes us. He produces his fruit in our lives as we read and ponder and listen to his word. The truth of Psalm 1 verses 2 and 3 is repeated by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12 verse 2, which we looked at not so long ago. The Apostle says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, and be changed in a positive way. He's saying be changed from living like the first Adam towards living like the second Adam. And how? By the renewing of your mind. Our character is transformed, our attitudes are changed, we live differently, we become stable, fruitful and consistent like Jesus by the renewing of our mind. And our mind is renewed, it's renovated, it's reoriented by continually putting truth into it. The word of Almighty God, the word that is living and powerful. I'm confident that most of you here this morning understand how important it is to regularly read the Bible and to meditate on it. I'm confident that most of you recognise how important it is to sit under good Bible teaching and to receive the word in, in other ways. The issue is less about understanding and more about motivation, isn't it? You've probably heard many sermons where the preacher banged on about having personal devotions and about being faithful in church attendance. I've probably banged on about that over the years and I make no apologies. But what I'm hoping is that today you will see this from a different perspective. 
We can apply ourselves to reading the Bible and coming to church out of a sense of duty because it's the right thing for a Christian to do, and it is. But what I hope you can see this morning is that this is the way to become the kind of person that you want to be. This tree in Psalm 1 is what we want to be, especially when life is difficult, especially in this season where things have never been more uncertain, where there is so much that can unsettle us and make us anxious. We're tempted to give up. We're tempted to let our Christian commitment fade out. We can so easily become unfruitful and then unfulfilled because that's what follows. And maybe today... You feel, you feel more like that boat being tossed to and fro by the wind. Or like a lost sheep. Or like that prodigal son starving in the pig pen. But in your heart you want to be this. This tree planted by a river of water. Stable, strong, healthy and fruitful. This is the way. You've got to get the words from off the page into here and into here. And maybe you've never been in the habit of reading the Bible. You're reading a little bit each day and then thinking about it. Or maybe it's something you've attempted in the past but never been able to sustain. It's, it's fallen by the wayside, fallen out of your life altogether. And your only engagement with the Bible is on Sundays at church or when you read your kids' Bible stories before bed. Let me encourage you to, to try again. Tomorrow morning or tomorrow evening, get out your Bible or load it up on your iPad or on your phone. Turn to the Gospel of Mark and read chapter 1. Or turn to the Psalms and read Psalm 1. It'll take you less than 10 minutes. Read the Word, think about it and pray. And then do it again on Tuesday. Read the next chapter. And on Wednesday. And if for some reason you miss on Thursday, don't give up. Don't feel bad. God's not going to punish you. Take it up again on Friday. And if you have any questions about what you read, ask someone. Ask me. Give me a call. Or come and talk to me on Sunday. Do it because you want to be like this tree. Because you want to be stable and fruitful and consistent. Do it because you want God to change you. May he bless the preaching of his word. Amen.